All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our first ever at LocoFlow live Zoom webinar. Very excited to have you all here. Um, my name is Ellen Frost. I am the owner of Local Color Flowers. For those of you who are unfamiliar with LocoFlow, I'll tell you just a little bit about me and about our business. Um, I'm the owner of, of a floral shop in Baltimore, Maryland. We started in 2008, becoming the first florist in Maryland to source all of our flowers locally. We have been doing weddings with all local flowers for the last 15 years. We also do retail floral design classes, corporate events. We have a flower book club, um, all kinds of fun things. And we do all of this with local flowers. I'm also an online course creator with the Gardener's Workshop. If any of you are familiar with Lisa Mason Ziegler and the Gardener's Workshop, I offer two online courses uh, through the Gardener's Workshop. One is called Growing Your Business with Local Flower Sourcing, and the other is Preparing to Sell to Florists. I'm also a speaker and a writer. I produce a weekly newsletter, so if you're interested in checking that out, um, I think because you signed up for this webinar, you'll start getting it. So I hope you enjoy it. And like all of you, I am a peony lover. So I am thrilled, beyond thrilled, to start this series of webinars with Karen from Midsummer Farm. I've been a customer of Karen's for five or six years now. And uh, her knowledge and her expertise and the quality of her flowers is just really uh, out of this world. And so I'm thrilled that she's here with us tonight to share all of her information with us. Um, and just a few housekeeping things. Um, we're gonna go for about an hour and then we'll leave time for questions at the end. We are recording, so um, just a note about that. And please, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I will monitor as we go. And when I'm presenting, Karen will monitor. Um, if there's something that's pressing, um, we can ask the question during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll wait till the end. Um, please feel free to chat in, you know, amongst yourselves as we go. Uh, it's always fun to make flower friends at these, at these kinds of things. We have a full agenda tonight, so we're gonna get started. Here's just a little list of what we're gonna be talking about. Types of peonies, recommended cultivars, how to source, plant, grow, harvest, store, end of the season cleanup, some selling and marketing, how to do some design with fresh peonies, and then we're going to talk about dried peonies. So we're going to get started, and I welcome Karen to us to, to us tonight. Hey, thanks, Ellen. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm Karen, I'm owner of Midsummer Farm. Uh, we're a certified naturally grown, uh, family owned a peony farm in Northern Virginia, just about an hour north of DC. I've got only about a half an acre planted of peony, but in that half an acre, we've got uh, about 900 plants. Uh, and we sell wholesale to designers and florists in the Maryland, DC, uh, Virginia area. So uh, we've differentiated ourselves a little bit from other growers by um, not only using organic practices, but also uh, specializing in kind of the more unique sought after cultivars that you're not generally gonna find at the big wholesale shops. So um, specializing in peony also means that our season is quick, as you probably realize, as we're just getting to the end of peony season now. Um, it's generally all of May and a little bit of June for us in uh, zone 7A, and then we're done. So there's a bit of maintenance throughout the year. You know, in October, we plant and we've got some weeding and fertilizing here and there. But really, the bulk of the work is confined to, you know, a little over a month. And that works out great for us because we are part-time farmers. Uh, both my husband and I have full-time, uh, pretty demanding jobs. We've got two kids, we've got animals, you know, our house obviously and our land. So we love that the season is very quick. The flowers are very sought after. Um, people love them. They're pretty easy sell. Uh, so I really believe that this business model is great um, as a side hustle, as a supplemental income during retirement, or something for stay-at-home parents to do for some extra income. 
Uh, and not only that, but you know, growing local is great for the environment. It's great for the industry. We'll talk a little bit about that, right, Ellen? That's Ellen's yeah. uh, passion as well. For sure. So um, yeah, so that's why I'm here spreading the word today about this business model and um, how we've tweaked it over the years and perfected it a little bit further. So hopefully others can learn a little bit from our mistakes. Okay, because originally we did not start out as a peony farm. Uh, this is a picture of our humble beginning here with our kids rolling out the first row of landscape fabric. Uh, we started Midsummer Farm in 2013 as a mixed bouquet flower farm. Our plan was to uh, sell at a popular urban farmer's market. Uh, so I had it in my head. You can see this uh, picture here, some horses in the background. We had horses but we had this field that we weren't using and we were just mowing, which drove me crazy. I really wanted it to uh, give back a little bit. So um, I wanted to generate some revenue. I did some research. I found that flowers were a great choice for small acreage. And you know, as soon as you hear something like that, or at least as soon as I do, I'm um, taken by all the possibilities, you know, thinking about all the different flowers I wanted to grow. I was a big fan of tulips and lavender and just the thought of this big, beautiful field filled with all different flowers, you know, it just uh, got me inspired. Um, I love learning new things and doing research. So jumped in with both feet. I studied and read books. Uh, Lisa Ziegler was one of many books that I read, Ellen. So yeah, um, I, I like everybody who's read Lisa and been inspired by her story and her sharing of information. She's great. Yeah, she's got a ton of information on her website. She's got classes. Um, you know, I went to Jenny Love. And so there was a lot of different um, resources. I carried around books for weeks. Uh, so I was extremely motivated. I was extremely excited to get this going. Um, but my first reality check was pretty quick. Uh, as a mixed bouquet farm, you think about it, right? Um, the farmer's market, it was like an urban farmer's market we were going to. So they wanted us to be there for six months. And we were thinking, okay, starting out, maybe we need, you know, 40 or 50 um, small to medium-sized bouquets to sell at this farmer's market every week for six months. So if you start doing the math and figuring, you know, a typical annual might bloom for a week or two, um, you know, how many flowers do you think you need to grow in order to make that happen? A lot. You know, a lot, <laughs> yes. It was, it was brutal. Uh, there's no one right answer. You know, there's a lot of different flowers you can grow. There's a lot to choose from. Uh, we ended up planting 38 different flowers, many of which were succession planted. So, you know, planted every week or two, like sunflowers or something. Um, so we had 72 plantings total. And this is my spreadsheet, which I know you can't read and that's okay. <laughs> uh, but the point is, it was a ton of starting seeds in my basement. It was planting, harvesting, you know, managing, figuring out some of these take darkness to sprout, some take light, some warm, some cool. You know, every flower was different. And not only that, but the weeding was intense. You know, all of these, when they were planted, and were at six, nine or 12 inch centers. So the weeds were just going crazy. And then we would spend all day Sundays at the farmer's market. So you can imagine if we were working full time and had kids and pulling all that off, that it was pretty exhausting. Oh my gosh. So yeah. <laughs> So about four years we did this and, you know, we set up all the infrastructure, we had drip irrigation, we had a cooler. Um, I learned all about all these different flowers, which sounds very romantic, but uh, it was, we were exhausted, you know. And so we came to the conclusion that this just was not sustainable for us, you know, not at least with two full-time jobs. Um, I know of a couple of growers that do this kind of thing, but they either one or both of the um, couple are doing it full time. So it's definitely possible uh, if you're a full time farmer, but not, not if you're doing it part time. So it was, it was sad. It was hard because this was my brainchild and we put in a lot of time and money and effort into this. Um, so we decided before we just 
chucked the whole idea that we try and simplify and streamline. And so what we did was decide to specialize in one flower and sell it wholesale instead of retail and decided on peony, uh, which turned out to be a great decision. Um, it was a lot less work and I'll talk a little bit about that. And it was more money, which is of course great. And we're working hard, but only for a little over a month. So awesome also, right? Awesome also. Awesome also. <laughs> so, and I mean, you know, who doesn't want a big field full of blooming peonies every spring? It's fabulous. I have to, you know, everybody loves it when they come to see the, the field. It is so, it's amazing to see. It is really like breathtaking. Yeah, I mean, the the mixed bouquets, you know, they you want them to bloom differently, you know, because you need it for six months. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something fabulous about every, having everything bloom almost all at once because you just come to the field. I mean, it's short, so that's a little bittersweet, but it's just beautiful when, when it's blooming. Um, there are a lot of other great choices to specialize in one or two flowers if you choose to go that route. Um, Ellen can probably talk a little bit about this more than I can, but um, some possibilities that I was thinking of include like lilac or viburnum, hydrangea. I don't know what else you got, Ellen. Are there are other I specialties. I really have seen people, you know, like woody perennials, I think is one. You know, Jenny in Love and Fresh Flowers, I think is focusing a lot on that now. We've also had people do, you know, um, flowering branches, woodies, you know, early in the season, winter and early spring, specializing. Um, those are two that we see, but, you know, specializing is really interesting. I don't think we see it as much um, as, you know, more varied um, plantings, but I think it is a really good option. Yep. I agree. I mean, and I, the perennial to annual thing makes a huge, huge difference. Oh, yeah. So you're if you're in yeah, but if you're able to um, just let her be. Perennial. And see if somebody was asking a question. But if you're able to choose a perennial, then I would definitely go with that. Um, and we choose peony not only because they're perennial, but they're also deer resistant, which it was a big one for us. We don't have any deer fence, and we've got tons of deer here, so um, we loved that about it. Uh, and they're also pretty forgiving, generally speaking. So uh, some quick facts about peony, in case you're not overly familiar, uh, they are a hardy perennial, uh, resistant to most pests. You know, we've only got a few insects that we worry about, not many at all. Uh, wow. The deer, the groundhogs all leave them alone. Uh, they do best with at least eight hours of sun. They're long lived, like 50 plus years. So you may need to will them to your children when you plant them. Uh, you plant them generally in the fall and they bloom in the spring. And you can plant them pretty much over most of the United States. They do well in zones three through eight, which is uh, just about everywhere except the deep south, like Florida and Georgia, where it really doesn't get cold at all. Uh, here, I space them up. What zone yeah. are you in? What growing zone are you in there? We're in 7A here in Northern Virginia. So we're getting on the warmer side of where peonies like it, but we're still good. Um, the main thing is that they like to have a period of cold in the winter. So as long as uh, they can feel that cold and you get them below freezing, at least for, I think it's 60 days or something like that, they need freezing temperatures, uh, then they're, they're happy. So that's why they do great in Alaska. You know, they're, yeah. they love the cold. Uh, they do take about four to five years to be mature enough to harvest, so you got to kind of factor that into your planning a little bit, but once they're mature, they produce for you every year. And the vase life is a little bit shorter than uh, other cut flowers, usually around five, six days. Sometimes we get like seven or eight, but um, we try and say about five days. And then the foliage dies off in the fall, and we talked about the cold in the winter. And then the one thing they are susceptible to is fungal diseases. Uh, so it's important to keep good air circulation. We want to dry off those leaves. If you're going to water, it's best not to water, you know, overhead where they're, you're going to be spraying the leaves with water. You want drip if you can, because uh, that's the one thing they are susceptible to. And they're uh, most commonly propagated by root division. Uh, some types of peonies will produce seeds, not all of them, but uh, if you see here in this diagram, the, uh, the, the picture on the right is after the bloom has 
finished and all the petals have fallen off, you'll get the seed pod and it'll turn brown kind of late fall and crack open. And you, depending on the variety, you may have some viable seeds there, but the seeds will not produce uh, the same as the parent plant. So they will be some hybrid of the two parents. Uh, and that's how new cultivars are made. So if you're ever interested in hybridizing, I would check out the American Peony Society page. They've got some great instructions for that. I've been meaning to do that for years now because it sounds fascinating, but just haven't carved out the time yet, unfortunately. But if you want like a Sarah Bernhardt peony, for example, you want to get a piece of Sarah Bernhardt root and don't bother with seeds. And there are three main types. Uh, the herbaceous here is shown on the left. That's the most common type that people have in their gardens. And that's the most common type that make good cut flowers. Uh, there, you may also hear people talk about tree peony. Uh, that's that center picture. And those get a little bit taller, they get some woody bark and the flower is much bigger and it's kind of got this open center, but they don't make good cut flowers. Um, I planted about 10 of these middle flowers that are kind of purple. Uh, they're called tree peony shimidagen. And um, before I knew any better, I planted 10 of them and they just don't last in the vase. So eventually I dug them up and gifted them out. But Ito or Ito or intersectional shown on the right is a uh, cross between the tree peony and the herbaceous peony. And some of those make good cuts. Um, it's kind of few and far between. Mostly you're going to be looking at herbaceous. Uh, but there are like this one here, the yellow is garden treasure and that makes pretty good cut. And then additionally, there's early, mid and late cultivars. Uh, you know, all peonies bloom in the spring but um, each bloom at a slightly different time. So if you are uh, planning to farm, it's a good idea to get some of each so you can extend your season for as long as possible. The difference between early and late is like, you know, four or five weeks, something in that vicinity. So um, your earliest ones are gonna be for us in zone 7A bloom about the first week in May, depending on weather. And then the latest ones are gonna start at the very end of May and go into the beginning of June. And especially I'd say if you are certainly if you're specializing in peonies, but even if you're just growing peonies along with other crops, having that early, mid, late, um, especially for florist sales, I think is really important because it really does give you, you know, the full length of time to sell peonies to florists. And they, because they are in such hot demand, they are definitely going to want them that full six weeks. Yeah, agreed. And even us, we've got a lot of early mids and lates, and we've really tried to spread that out. But um, even so, like we don't really have any early whites, for example, and we don't really have any late yellows. Right. So, um, you know, white is one of the first things that the florists are asking for. So I'm like, oh, I got to find a white that's early. How am I going to, you know? Right. So it's great to have, you know, a lot of different varieties and cultivars to yep. choose from. And then there's flowers all come in different forms also, just to make things a little bit more complex. Um, single, semi-double, double, and bomb. And those are all pictured here. Uh, the singles are probably a little less sought after by the florists, I would say. Um, all the others are pretty much up for grabs. But there are over 7,000 cultivars registered with the American Peony Society. And that's a lot. All different colors and different, you know, bloom types and early, mids, and lates and colors and whatnot. We probably see about 30 to 40 different types a, a year. So to, to think that there are seven something thousand out there is <laughs> really know. amazing. I know. Well, they all don't make good cuts. Right. So you've got to pick the ones that make good cut flowers. You know, some of them are better for landscape um, and some of them are better for cut flowers and some of them are tree peony, which don't really make good cuts at all. So, right. Um, but we have a couple of our top picks here, um, things that have uh, grown and sold well for us. And our first pick is our top pick, um, etched salmon. If you guys are, you know, doing mixed bouquets or something, you've got to pick one peony. That would be my pick. That's the one that got Ellen's attention. I think the first time, yes, right? I definitely agree. <laughs> I was singing the praise of etched salmon twice today for two growers who were saying, Oh, should I grow more of this one? And I said, grow as much as you can. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, we'll get into like side buds and things in a minute here, but it doesn't have any side buds. It's just a great 
robust grower. It's a healthy plant. You know, I think it took us maybe three years and just all of a sudden we just got a ton of blooms on that one. And customers love them. Yes, they're beautiful. And they just get, they start out fairly small, but they just get bigger as they mature. It's, yeah, they're just fabulous. And then Sarah Bernhardt is shown here on the right, um, which I didn't want to grow. I was against growing Sarah Bernhardt 100% because we were trying to differentiate ourselves by being, you know, the unique, the more boutique kind of uh, flowers that we were choosing were, you know, really more unusual, more pricey kind of roots and that kind of thing. And Sarah Bernhardt is very common. It's like the most common. Um, it's what everybody thinks of when you say peony. Yes. So, yeah. So the problem with not growing Sarah Bernhardt is that when you tell people you grow peony, that's the first thing they want is the Sarah Bernhardt fluffy pink peonies. So I eventually broke down and put in a row of Sarah Bernhardt's and I'm not sorry at all. They're beautiful and I love them too. So I see what the goal <laughs> is. And so we'll see how they do. They're not quite mature enough uh, yet for us to harvest, but we're getting there. And then some, uh, some more coral charm is a big uh, hot contender, especially for events I found. I think you sell a lot of these, right, Ellen? Yes, coral charm. Like you said with Sarah Bernhardt, I would say coral charm is the other peony that people know the name of, like regular. Yeah. Customers. And they often do ask for coral charm. And we have a lot of people that want them for event work, for sure. That color yeah. is very unique and people love it. Yeah, it's beautiful for sure. I mean, and it's, when we have pick your own, which we only do once a year, but um, when we have pick your own, everybody wants the coral. That's yeah. the first thing they go to, really. If they're not a pink person, if they're pink, they go for the Sarah Bernhardt's. But yeah. And then lemon chiffon um, is a fairly new cultivar that, uh, you know, not too many people know that there is such thing as yellow peony, but lemon chiffon is beautiful and phenomenal oh. and love it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And it's a great seller. For, for florists doing wedding work, um, you know, also the Pantone color of the year was yellow a few years ago, and we're still seeing a lot of yellow in weddings. And we used a lot of these yellows, um, a bunch of the yellows, Sunny Girl, and, you know, a bunch of them this year, and people really love them. Yeah. Yep. And then white, I would say, is probably the most, at least for me, I don't know if you would agree, Ellen, if it's white or pink, it's kind of a toss up for us, but yeah. I think white is the most um, sought after color, probably for weddings for the most part. So we've got several whites that we grow. These are two of them. Um, Bowl of Cream is giant and it's kind of this antique white color, almost, almost creamy. Um, a lot of people love this one. And then Amelia Olson is a little bit smaller. I mean, not small, but right. just not giant um, and a little bit looser form. Uh, so that's a pretty popular one as well. Yeah, love them both. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of good ones. I mean, there's really yeah. there's not too many uh, bad ones that you can pick out. Right. And then where where can you get these roots? Where do I buy them, right? So uh, there are a lot of great reputable sources. Um, this list here, we've ordered, ordered at one time or another from all of them, including a few that have gone out of business, uh, like Song Sparrow comes to mind. I ordered from them as well. Um, they're no longer around, but I've ordered from all of these sources. They're all good. They're all reputable. You'll get a uh, great root stock from all of them and a lot of good choices. Uh, but almost all of our roots now come from Peony Shop in Holland. Um, we import them every year. Uh, they not only have more unique um, and beautiful cultivars, but they their quality is top notch. They've got huge roots. You can see this is a picture of um, they're typical, I'm doing air quotes here, if you don't see me, <laughs> three to five eye uh, roots, which, you know, this one I think has got more like 10 or 12. And they're actively hybridizing and registering new cultivars every year. And we started partnering with them a few years ago uh, by collecting um, a group order from the United States, um, taking care of the customs and the importation of the roots. And then we pick up the palette of roots at the airport every October, sort them and reship them out throughout the United States. So um, it's just like a, a group order, if you've ever done like a co-op order, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in getting in on that, you know, drop me an email at this email address. Um, Cause I would, you know, their roots are just phenomenal. Everybody I've talked 
talked to about them are really happy with them. That's awesome. Okay, and once you have your roots, right, you want to plant them. So we want to pick a sunny location um, with good drainage because if your roots are sitting in standing water, they're going to rot, especially over the winter. Uh, so good drainage is a must. I would recommend getting a soils test. A lot of people try and skip that step, but it's pre actually pretty easy. I think it's like 20 bucks. Uh, we use Waypoint Analytical just because I like their color-coded results. They're easy to read, but there are a lot of a lot of different places there you can get a soils test from. And it gives you a lot of good information. And then we prepare the area by adding some leaf compost, organic leaf compost, which helps with drainage and you know organic matter and that kind of thing. And we add a little bit of fertilizer, um, which for us, we use something called Replenish, which is uh, an organic fertilizer that's fairly low in nitrogen. And then we uh, mix it in with a little bit of bone meal, which is high in phosphorus. And we only do that because our particular soil is low in phosphorus. So you should choose your fertilizer based on your soils test. And then you want to set the root in the hole and cover it with one to two inches of soil. And that's, you know, in the sort of middle area of the United States. Um, in warmer climates, you can go a little bit shallower. In colder, you can go a little bit deeper. But you want to be sure not to bury these roots too deep, because if you do, you might get a big, beautiful, leafy plant, but um, very few or no flowers. So we get that question a lot. You know, I've got this peony and it comes up great every year. It looks really healthy, but we don't get any flowers. What's the deal? And it may be that you planted it too deep. We get that question all the time. Yeah, and that's one of the big ones. The answer until this presentation. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is a little portion of our field in April. Uh, we choose to have grass aisles. It's one of the, the few choices we made that actually gives us a little bit more work instead of less because we really tried to streamline a lot, but um, I like the visual appeal of the grass aisles. Um, they do need to be maintained, they need to be mowed, and you can't let them get too long because then they go to seed and then, you know, you're running your mower through it and it's blowing these grass seeds all over, all into the holes where your peony are, which is, of course, not ideal. So it's something to consider. Um, I know other farmers use landscape fabric in the aisles. You know, they just cover the whole area with landscape fabric. Um, I know, like Lisa does uh, chopped up leaves, right? Yep. Um, she's big on that, and I would love to do that, but I just hadn't had the time to try and source these yeah. chopped up leaves and, you know, whatnot. And I've seen others even do mulch. Yeah. So it's another option. But Here, I love the grass. Can I ask about the grass for a second? Did you, when you were thinking about grass, did you think, like, I like aesthetically how it looks, and I'm thinking that people are going to come here and pick their own or, like, see the space? Yeah, I mean, I don't think at the time we were considering pick your own at all. Yeah. I just, I just really, honestly hate the, the look yeah. of the all the weed fabric and no grass yeah, or it no, looks you know, beautiful and yeah. it looks like it's intentional because people like it does show well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And if you're gonna have pick your own at all, I mean, I think yeah. you have to have grass or or some sort of green. You know, you could do something like clover is probably even better than right. grass, but. Um, but if you're really just utilitarian, you want to just grow flowers and you want it to be as simple as possible, then you could cover it all with weed fabric for sure. And then we had, just because we're on this slide, somebody had a question about um, about landscape fabric and yeah. how it works for these. This person's asking sort of pros and cons of using it. And like, what do you do if it gets damaged or frayed or moldy? Do you replace it? Like, how does that work for... For a perennial like peonies. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I do hit it with the mower pretty, you know, commonly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and we have had to replace it because we started all this in 2013. So it, um, some of it was starting to get to the end of its life. Um, mm -hmm. Our particular uh, landscape fabric is the woven uh, weed fabric that we get from like a, a farm supplier. Do not use the Home Depot, you know, weed fabric or the, the home store weed fabric. It doesn't work, not even a little bit. 
So you want to get the woven weed fabric. And even then, it probably needs to be, at least for us, replaced every, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years, depending um, on how often you hit it with the mower. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and do you do that in the winter or in the early spring, like when everything's died back or how do you do that? Yeah. So that with peony, it's not too bad because what I do is I do it um, either very early spring or late winter when everything is cut down to the ground. And I'll show you, you know, what you do at the end of the season. But at the end of the season, all of the, all of this growth is gone. So you can kind of roll out. It's, it's a little bit of a pain, but you roll out a little bit of fabric. You see where the the foliage is, but it's really short and low to the ground. You cut the hole around the foliage and then you roll out a little bit more. Got so it. um, it's a bit of a pain, but it's not, it's not terrible. You know, it's, um, it's doable and it doesn't need to be done all that often. Right. So we do replace it, but it's, you know, it, it lasts a good seven, eight years for us typically. And it doesn't get like moldy or anything. It just, um, it just starts to wear out and stuff starts to grow. Right. You know, you get little right. weeds growing through little holes and things. Got like it. that. Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to ask this question of Ellen since not everybody has their mics on. Um, what do you think is the question we get asked the most when we tell people we are peony farmers? Well, I guess if it's any indication of how many questions I get asked at the shop when I have peonies, it's got to be either ants. I'm going to ants is my first. But yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody wants to know about ants. That's Everybody the first has question. memories of ants on peonies. Yes. You know, they're at the grandma, grandmother's house and there's yeah. this old peony bush and just a couple with ants. How do we get rid of them? Um, well, basically the answer, the short answer is that we don't. We like the ants. We keep them. Um, they don't, actually don't harm the plants. They don't harm the flower. Uh, they just like to eat the sticky sap that's there very early spring before the flower uh gets ready to bloom. Um, a lot of people think that the ants are required to, you know, to eat the sap so the flower can open. That's, I think, an old wives tale. That's not true, but um, they don't do any harm. And um, I've even heard that they can be beneficial by not only getting that sticky stuff off the flowers and the leaves, but also aerating the soil, um, eating harmful pests like aphids. Um, and since we're certified naturally grown, we just embrace most of the, you know, insects that are in our field, the birds and the animals, uh, as we believe a natural ecosystem is the best balance. So we're not going to start a fight if it, you know, if it's not needed. Uh, since we harvest the flowers in bud, it's easy to see the ants if there are any and kind of just give them a gentle shake off. Um, you know, once, once the flowers bloom and if your ants are all like within all of those petals, well, that like makes it way more difficult. But um, for us, we just remove them. We just shake them off. All right, and side buds. Uh, once your plants are growing and um, some cultivars you'll find have side buds and some don't. And I would love to be able to grow all cultivars that, you know, none of them have side buds, so we wouldn't have to deal with them, but uh, that would really limit our choices quite a bit. So. We do have uh, quite a few that have side buds. And you can see here on this diagram, there's usually a, a central stem that's got the main bud, the main flower, and then anywhere from like two to six side buds that come and branch off. And these are great if you've got a landscape plant that's you know in the front of your house because the side buds bloom a little bit later, so you get a longer time of enjoying the peony blooms. But for cut flowers, they're not great. You know, um, they get in the way, they weigh down the stem. Um, and if you cut them off early, the energy can go into that central bloom and you get a bigger flower. So uh, we come out with the clippers in early spring and we just hit all those side buds down every row. So it's a bit of a chore, but um, it does make me appreciate the cultivars that don't have side buds like Lorelei and Itch Salmon. And for people who are thinking they're resisting cutting those side buds, Believe me when I say that the florists don't want the side buds either, and we will just cut them off anyways. So mm -hmm. it's better to, you know, produce a stronger bloom on that on that one single bloom. We really can't use unless you're doing like a market bouquet or something like a mixed bouquet. Um, we really don't ever use them with the side buds on. 
And frankly, what happens is we cut them off. They end up in like a mason jar on the table until we throw them away. Like it's just, you know, the single stem is the way that florists expect to, them to be sold. Yeah. And I think sometimes when the side buds are there, when you're giving them to a florist, that it feels like they're, you know, they haven't completed their job or something, right? That it's, yeah. yeah. Yep. So take them off. Take them off. <laughs> And then peony are typically left alone by groundhogs, deer, beetles, you know, most of the pests. If you've ever grown vegetables or, you know, dahlias or anything like that, you know that that's huge. But the one thing that they are susceptible to is fungal disease. So uh, most commonly are these two, powdery mildew and botrytis. Um, I'll admit I haven't gotten my fungicide plan quite perfected yet uh, because we're certified naturally grown I'm kind of limited in what I can use uh, your best bet is to um, spray for um, any fungal disease before it shows up and you know kind of keep a regular spraying going on uh, but that said peony um, weaken towards the end of the season which for them is like you know late summer and they will typically, you know, show signs of powdery mildew and botrytis towards the end of their of their season. So the best bet is to just keep those leaves as healthy as possible for as long as possible, so they can keep collecting, you know, the sunlight and the water and all of that stuff to keep sending the energy to those roots for the following season. And then you want to uh, practice good hygiene at the end of the season, which I'll touch on here in a minute. And uh, support, you know, when if uh, you're used to your grandmother's peonies, then you might have seen them kind of mashed down in dirt. Or, you know, sometimes I've heard a lot of stories about husbands that just sort of mow over whatever peonies are there because they're, you know, just laying down because they've gotten too heavy. Uh, so normally you might see a tomato cage or something similar that's going to keep those heavy flowers out of the dirt. Um, but so far in our field, we don't have any of that, and I hope to keep it that way. We're trying to keep things simple, right? Um, and there are a few strategies that we do to achieve this. Uh, first of all, we harvest in bud, right? We've talked about that a little bit. We're going to talk about it some more, but um, we harvest when before the flowers are open. And when the, once the flowers open, they're going to collect rainwater. They're going to, you know, the wind is going to hit them more. So there's going to be a lot more effect there. But when you harvest in bud, they're a lot lighter, um, easier for the stems to hold up. And then we snip the side buds, right, which also keeps mm -hmm. a lot of the weight off of those stems. Uh, we also try to choose cultivars when we plant with strong stems. And so a lot of the newer um, varieties, newer hybrids are bred for stronger, thicker stems. You'll find the older varieties that are you know, from the 17, 1800s, they may be beautiful, but they generally have um, much thinner stems. And so they're gonna be a little bit more susceptible to this drooping um, once they open up. And then additionally, uh, we live in a really windy area. We're at the base of a, of a small mountain and the winter winds and the early spring winds are huge. And we just let it go, man. We just, we let the spring winds blow and all the stuff is growing and it's a little cringy. You know, you, <laughs> it, it makes me a little nervous every year because you see the winds blowing these things all over the place. But um, there is some research that supports my theory um, that when the stems, you know, are experiencing wind and bending and that kind of thing, that more energy is going to go towards, uh, you know, making them stronger and their support. Whereas if you're going to give them a tomato cage to lean on, then the plant isn't going to feel like it needs to, you know, send more energy to those stems. So I don't know if I've got it makes that's a, sense, but it seems very nerve wracking. <laughs> it is. But, you know, um, one, one of my theories, too, is that I don't worry too much about um, like small minor losses. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I'll get, you know, a worm or something that'll drill a little hole in some of the peony buds. I don't panic and spray everything, you know, or I get a broken stem here and there from a windstorm um, or a thunderstorm and I don't panic and, you know, support everything. So I think you've got to expect, 
you know, I don't know, 5% or 3% or I don't know what the number is, but you got to expect there to be a little bit of natural losses. Um, and, and then I think everything kind of balances out a little bit better and you don't have to micromanage it so much. Right. Okay. Harvest. This, this is, I like this topic. Me too. <laughs> um, I'm going to give you some rules of thumb, but there are a lot of exceptions. Okay. Um, it takes a lot of practice basically to perfect because every cultivar is different and seriously, every cultivar is a little different, but um, you want to harvest enclosed bud before uh, before it starts opening completely. And um, you want to squeeze that bud. And when it's soft like a marshmallow is generally when you want to harvest. And don't be scared to squeeze it. I go through rows, you know, just squeezing buds as I go to see what's ready to go and what's not. So that said, um, you know, some of the, some examples of some exceptions to that rule are like, the giant varieties, you know, you've got Henry Boxtos, you've got the bowl of cream, that's these big giant flowers. You know, if you harvest those when they first start to soften up, it's just too early. They just need more time. Um, I found that if I wait until the petals start, it, like they're kind of an open bud and they're soft and for a long time. And then once the petals start to extend out of that bud is when I start to take them. So, you know, you wouldn't know that unless you just start you know, harvesting some and trying it, right? So, I mean, I, I, I take a lot of samples and I put them on my kitchen table and I take some notes and really you just start to learn about each cultivar and they really are all different. So I think it's important to do that and put the work in for that because harvesting at the wrong time is a big deal. I mean, you can probably agree to that, right? Yeah, <laughs> so. we, uh, I mean, we get, because we, are getting flowers from so many growers, we see a lot of like the, the different ways that people harvest, the different times that people harvest. And we had like one particular situation um, this year where somebody sent um, some peonies that were, were really harder than, you know, marshmallow stage. And the person, I mean, genuinely, you know, when I talked to them about it had like good reasoning, they said, well, the van is kind of warm on delivery. And we're afraid that they might open up in the delivery van. But these were really very hard. Um, and we kept them and trimmed them and kept them in warm water. And it took almost six days for them to open. Mm. So, you know, it's past any florist who is buying peonies, I think, is expecting them to open within a day or two um, so that they can be used for events or for single orders or whatever. Um, I don't think anyone expects to wait a week you know, to buy a product and then wait a week for it to open. Um, so really having that timing. And I think that is a difference that's just experience. You know, like you said, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of testing um, to make sure that those those flowers are being harvested right at the right time. Yeah, yeah, agreed. There's just a lot of exceptions to the rule. And I think it's important to, to know the cultivars that you're growing well. Yeah. You know, this uh, this red one that you see in the picture here is um, Mackinac Grand, um, and that's a semi-double. So it's got, you know, less petals than the doubles or the, or the um, bombs. So the ones that have less petals, you can actually harvest a little earlier. So a little bit more firm, you know, not hard like a marble exactly. But so again, you know, you need to, you just need to practice. Um, you know, one strategy I often use too is that I wait until one flower in the row. Um, we've got, you know, one row per cultivar. So I wait for one flower in the row to completely open before I start har harvesting at all. And then I still, right. you know, use, use these strategies, but at least I know that, you know, um, we're not a week out, generally speaking. So, Karen, we've got two questions about this stage of the peony. So one person's asking, have you ever had a hot, dry spring where the sap on the buds is so thick that you have to rinse the peony off? Um, we get a lot of rain in Northern Virginia where we actually have more of a problem with dealing with the powdery mildew and everything because we are very humid here mm -hmm. and we get a lot of rain. But I will say when I go through and do the side buds, it's usually very early spring. And it is sticky. Everything is just really, you know, like my hands turn black from all the wow. little sap. 
um, and touching it and everything. So it doesn't surprise me. Um, the ants actually do help with that, um, as I talked yeah. about, but um, rain, you know, or, or if, if you have to, I hate to say to water overhead because you're really supposed to avoid doing that because of the uh, right. fungus issues. But, um, but, you know, if you rinse it some in some way with just a hose or something that also takes some of that sap off, it just is sugar, so it dissolves. Um, but I, yeah, it gets covered in that stuff in early spring for sure. And then someone else asked that they had buds on their plants this year, but some of the buds never opened. And they're asking if you think that's because of lack of rain. Some of the buds never opened. If they turn like brown, you know, if the if they stay in bud form, but you start to see brown spots, sometimes that can be a fungal disease. Okay. And, you know, they don't open then uh, because they're kind of stressed out. So I have seen that before. I don't know if I've ever seen it just like never open with nothing else going on. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else that might be. One more question before we move on. We're going to talk about, somebody's asking about fertilizing, which I know we're going to talk about. Somebody asked about interplanting. Um, would you ever interplant with peonies, like put daffodils in there with them or anything else? Or do you suggest they just be planted by themselves? Um, I, I think planting more things is generally good. I mean, we... We only have peony, which uh, is probably not the best way to go because, you know, you just you want to have different sure. you know, a variety of different flowers in case you have a problem um, with one flower. You can rely on the other kind of deal. But um, so I don't think there's any problem with, you know, putting in something different in there. I just haven't done it myself. Sure. Cool. All right. We'll wait for the for the next one here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, we got to keep moving. It looks like I'm getting over time here. Um, the uh, This is a shot of our the inside of our walk-in cooler. Um, it's not very glamorous, as you can see, but um, this works great for us. We're very happy with it. We just bought a prefab shed, um, installed it on a gravel pad, put in an air conditioning unit and a cool bot and spray foam insulation. So um, I think cool bots are used by just about everybody in the floral industry. Uh, they're fabulous. The website has tons of information about how to insulate and how to use it and how to hook it up. And we did this ourselves. Uh, so, and it's been, you know, every year it just starts right up and, you know, we keep the cooler. About well, that's amazing. Degrees. It is amazing. It just like, you, like you said, ours runs for years on end. No problem. It just, yeah. it's, it's a great, great product. No, I love it. Um, you know, ideally our cooler needs more insulation, honestly, but it's just been one of those things on our, on my to-do list that I never get to. But, um, so don't take this as the, uh, as the perfect solution, but, um, but the cool bot is great. Uh, the air conditioner was simple to install and yeah, I mean, it keeps it pretty consistently at about 35 degrees for us. So it's great. That's great. And then um, we've experimented with different methods of storing the peonies. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about wrapping in newspaper and wrapping in plastic and stacking them horizontally and all this stuff. Uh, we found that vertically in buckets uh, dry, you know, we don't have any water in any of these buckets, uh, works great for us. So that's a picture on the right that shows um, just our storage and we've got them labeled and then, you know, we got them on that top shelf as well. And that's all we do, so. And they get sold pretty quick, so they're kind of in and out. And then you want to wait until late summer or early fall before you remove any foliage. You want to leave those leaves on there as long as possible so they can feed that root. Um, so that typically means all summer. Once it gets into like late summer, your plant's going to start to look kind of sad. It's going to start to get some brown spots, and eventually it's gonna look like this, um, but that's normal. That's normal at the end of the season. So that's what all of our plants look like at the end. And it's it's kind of depressing. I don't like it, but that's the way it goes. And uh, I'll admit, I admitted this to Ellen that before I was a peony farmer, I had a couple of peony plants in the front of our house and uh, they did this. They turned brown like this at the end of the season and I thought I killed them or they died and I dug them up and threw them away. I had no idea. So, you know. Not an expert at the time, clearly, but now I know. That's how we learn. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so don't dig them up. They're fine. Um, so at this point, you're going to cut the plant down near the ground, you know, maybe an inch off the ground or something. You're going to cut off all that foliage and you want to dispose of it. Don't leave it and mow it in. Don't compost it. You want to get rid of it. Throw it away or burn it. Um, we have burn piles at the end of the season um, because that that fungal disease, uh, that powdery mildew, when the when the plant starts to get weak towards the end of its life for the season, um, it's going to succumb to the powdery mildew and some of the fungal diseases. And if you leave those leaves and you leave those branches, they're just going to overwinter and that fungal disease will come back strong early spring. So get rid of it all. And a quick note about the benefits of locally grown and naturally grown flowers. Um, most of the flowers available at conventional florists, if you don't know, in grocery stores are shipped from Colombia and Ecuador, which, you know, they've got to be refrigerated and transported, which is huge as far as carbon and hydrofluorocarbons, terrible for the environment. Um, and they're also treated with chemicals to kill insects and survive the long trip. Also not great, especially if you're giving them to your mother for Mother's Day or something, yes. you know, they're just coated in chemicals. Um, and even though you're not consuming them, you know, they sit on your dinner table, they're handled by you and your family. Uh, so our flowers are certified naturally grown. They don't travel very far. They're fresh. Uh, we like to say they're safe to sniff. And uh, we've got tons of beneficial insects all through our field. And that's mother nature keeping balance, which is way better than me trying to micromanage with chemicals. So um, and and that's I think basically. more and more certified natural, naturally grown, I think, is becoming, I, I mean, the, the concept, I think, already was, but also the certification, I think, is becoming more marketable among florists who are, you know, having clients who are interested in, you know, sustainable events, smaller footprints, things like that. Yeah, agreed. I think it's more and more popular. Mm -hmm. You know, people are very into um organic and naturally grown for, you know, vegetables and things. I think flowers are just going to be the next thing. Yeah. And then once your farm is up and running, your plants are producing, you've got to figure out what you're going to do next, right? Now what? Who do I sell it to? How do I sell it? Um, so you want to price your stems first, which is going to vary a lot on your market and your location. Um, you generally are not going to have a lot of luck selling flowers in a rural area, at least in my experience. You want to go to the urban areas. And even then, you know, your prices are going to vary a lot. But there are several strategies you can use to pick your price. Um, first, I'd get a wholesale account with a flower wholesaler near you. Uh, one near us is Potomac Floral. And you can, you know, sign up uh, for an account, and then you can even have them deliver some flowers to you, and you can compare their flowers to yours, and how easy was it for you to order and pay, and what's the base life, and what was their price. So that's, I think, a good way to get started and, you know, try and uh, narrow down your pricing. And then if you join the Association for Specialty Cut Flower Growers, uh, they've got a ton of information, education, videos, recommendations, and they also have pricing lists for a lot of different flowers. So definitely worth it. And then you wanna um, put yourself in the shoes of your ideal client. You know, what, what are you offering? Um, are you low, naturally grown, unique cultivars? Is your pricing great or, you know, your customer service fantastic? Um, how does that compare? And that's the best way to set your price. Karen, somebody asked if there is a change in stem price depending on the cultivar. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, most wholesalers do charge different prices depending on the cultivar. Um, we don't because, once again, we, we try and streamline wherever we can. And I just have one price and it's just because it's too hard to keep up with otherwise. Um, but for the most part, yeah, if you've got a more rare cultivar, um, something that's really pricey and fancy, it's going to get a higher price than um, your Festiva Maxima and your Sarah Bernhardt. I'll tell you, though, as a as the buyer, um, just like that streamlinedness in pricing is very easy for me. We have oh, lots good? of growers who you know, have ranges between, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, 
it's a lot to take in if there's 30 different kinds of peonies being sold and everyone is like a quarter difference or 50 cents difference. Um, so having one price, I have to say, makes like the florist job very easy to budget. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it easier for us too. I just can't keep up, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> we just make it simple wherever we can. Right. Um, so anyway, that, that leads us to customers and marketing. And my marketing step one is to make friends with Ellen. If you're anywhere near Baltimore, uh, she is fantastic and we are very appreciative uh, she really I weirdly us... have the same t-shirt on tonight. I, is, oh, is wow, yeah. Sure? So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's her at our, at our field. And um, she really gave our specialty farm a big step up. So it's appreciated. But if you don't have an Ellen, then you need to find your Ellen equivalent. And, uh, you know, your florist, perhaps, that uh, embraces locally grown. And, you know, some florists will turn their nose up at locally grown. They'll think you're just, you know, this backyard person that you know has a few handfuls of peony and you know whatever so just don't let that bother you and find find the florist that you know that matters yeah um some other uh tips on marketing is just to decide on your customer you know like for us straight to consumer um was not really in the cards it just takes too much time um dealing with the general public uh and with two full-time jobs it just you know we couldn't um, we found that out the hard way going through that whole farmer's market ordeal that we went through. Uh, so we decided on florist and event planners, and that's just a simpler uh, business model, in our opinion. And then marketing, um, you want to be just be well versed on what you're bringing to the table. Uh, you know, you can when you go up to your prospective florist, for example, you might tell them that you're uh, flowers have longer vase life because you're local or you've got these really interesting cultivars that they've never seen before. Um, you can deliver on short notice. They're like, oh my gosh, I've got this event and none of the peonies opened that I thought were going to open that I got from so-and-so. So now I need something last minute. You know, I'll call this person. They're right around the corner and they can get it to us quickly, that kind of thing. So there's lots of different uh, ways you can offer value. For sure. And okay, I'm like over time, I've got to hand it over to Ellen, but I uh, just okay. want to say briefly here that if you're hungry for more details, we do have a book on this topic called Peonies for Perpetual Profit. It's available on Amazon. Um, and we go into a lot more detail on all of these topics, including um, I actually give our income and expenses from our farm from last year, um, our time commitments, uh, more of our recommended cultivars, and more of our lessons learned, which I would recommend reading about because it's a lot easier to avoid them that way than <laughs> living through them. So with that, I'm going to hand it over. I definitely recommend Karen's book. It's we've actually, I read it, read it twice just this season because we got ready for a peony class at the shop and I wanted to review it. And it really is just full of amazing information. So I would I highly recommend picking one up. Um, and before I'm going to, before I'm talk about design, I want to quick ask Karen two questions that came up. One was about um, maintaining soil health after planting. Do you fertilize again, or is it just at the initial planting? Uh, we fertilize when we plant, and then we also fertilize once a year in early spring um, using that mixture I told you about with the replenish and the, um, the bone meal, but you know that's specific to our soil, so you should definitely choose uh, based on your soils test. But you can also... Um, fertilize twice a year if you choose to, once in early spring and once in like mid to late summer. Okay. Uh, we haven't gotten that organized yet. You know, we find that fertilizing just during planting and then early spring is enough. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not growing commercially, if you're just growing for your own kind of cut flowers, you don't even really need to fertilize. You, you know, you've probably seen peony plants that grow for, you know, hundred years or something that never have been fertilized once so I mean, right. you don't necessarily need to, but if you are going commercial, you want, you want to keep up with the fertilization. Yeah. And then one last one, do you have a suggestion or a recommendation on spacing? Uh, yes, we space at 36 inches on center. Um, for our plants, you can go a little bit tighter than that if you're in a drier climate, but you got to be a little careful because, you know, when, when you get those leaves or start to cross over, it's harder for the moisture to um, 
evaporate, you know, so it's going to stay on the leaves longer and you might get some powdery mildew and that kind of thing. Um, you can also do staggered, which we haven't done. We just do like one row of peony, you know, three feet on right. center. But you could also do like this, you know, where you're, you've got um, a staggered row and then you can fit more peony in that way. But we, we had enough room not to have to deal with that. Cool. All right, everyone. Now you know how to grow peonies. Now you have to know at least a little bit about designing with peonies. Um, we love designing with peonies. Uh, we start getting peonies this year. You know, it was the right at the beginning of May, which is, you know, peak wedding time, peak graduation time, event time. Um, and everybody loves peonies. So we really do use peonies in everything really for like that four to six weeks, every, every event has peonies in it. You can see these are just two examples of some bridal bouquets that we have done um, with peonies. They are showstoppers for sure. Um, all right, Karen, so we can go to the next. So some things to think about for arranging with peonies for events. So this would be weddings, corporate events, galas, things like that. The first thing is to make sure that you're timing your peonies to be open for the reveal. Um, one of the challenges with peonies we talked about before is getting the timing right of having them open. Um, you never want, or at least I never want to arrive at a wedding and hand the bride her bouquet and the peonies are still tight balls. Um, that is not the way you want to present them. They really are the wow factor in a bouquet. You want them totally open for the reveal. Um, in order to be able to do this, you really need, I think, to practice. We practice a lot with peonies to make sure that we understand from each of our growers how long they take to open and how when they will be ready so that we can be fully open for the event. Um, and we talked about this before. A key to that is really working with a reputable grower um, that you can communicate with on the regular to say, hey, I have an event on Saturday. Should I get delivery from you Wednesday? Should I get it Thursday? Should I keep them in the cooler, out of the cooler? Um, having that relationship with a local grower who you can rely on, I think for us has made all the difference. Um, and if you're in a pinch, you know, you can trim stems and put them in hot water. That sometimes works. You can trim them, put them in hot water and put them in a hot room. Uh, we've put them inside the van, outside in the parking lot, in the sun, try to get them to open. Um, you can also, you know, really manually massage them open. Don't be afraid. They are like a little bit sturdier than maybe you think. You can massage them open. Um, we do remove all of the leaves. The leaves, you know, don't hydrate great. They don't look great in design. You really want to take those off. And if you are designing when the peony is in bud or not fully open, make sure that you are giving enough space in your design for for that peony to open because what you don't want is to jam all your flowers up against a peony bud and then when it opens there's no room for anything else in there and everything gets squashed so make sure you give them you know plenty of room and for events really vase life doesn't matter you know we we want those flowers to look perfect on the day of the wedding or on the day of the event, we don't care if they die the next day. Um, that means that you can hold peonies in the cooler. You can, um, you know, use peonies that look the best, even if they might be, you know, four or five days old. Sometimes that's when peonies do look the best. Um, and in for events, you for us, we do have a lot more flexibility in spending just because these budgets are much bigger. Um, you get more bang for your buck when you're, you know, buying for events. Uh, we just have a lot more flexibility that way. It's a little bit different when you're designing for like a single order. So this is like send out a birthday arrangement or an anniversary arrangement or something like that. Um, we often send these peonies out the door closed. So I just told you before, you don't want to send out event flowers closed. These you do want to send out closed at least closed enough that they're going to open in the client's house that day or the next day. Um, if you're sending them out open, it's often that the petals can get damaged, they can get bruised, um, you can lose petals, uh, and really the vase life can be compromised at that point. If the flowers are already blown open and you're delivering them that way, 
Um, we really do like to have them in that marshmallow or even a little bit bigger than that marshmallow stage so that they open in a customer's house. And also you want to, as a florist, I think manage the expectations of vase life with your customers. They can, you know, like Karen said, the vase life is maybe five days, six days, seven days, if you can really push it. Um, but, you know, if you're sending out an arrangement to somebody's home for their birthday, they really are expecting a long lasting arrangement. So um, again, if you're sending them out a little bit more closed, that those people are probably going to get a little more vase life out of them. And you have to really be careful. If you're a florist using peonies in a single order, you know, our standard markup should be, and I can't always do this, standard markup for a florist is three times the flower price. So, you know, if you buy a peony for $4, you know, you really should be charging the customer $12 per peony. Um, that means if you're using, you know, three peonies in an arrangement, you're already at almost 40 bucks. Um, what you don't want to do is, you know, send out a $50 arrangement with five peonies that really cost you $75. Um, you'll just, you'll lose your, lose your hat on that. Um, and really customers do love straight bunches of peonies. People love peonies just by themselves. I do too. That's very classic. It's a very, um, you know, it's a very sought after look. So um, we do sell peonies by the bunch, straight bunches and by the stem and people love them. Um, so consider selling straight bunches. I think people will enjoy that. And I wanna make a note about stored and dried peonies. And Karen, maybe you can chime in here because somebody did have a question about how long you can dry store peonies. Um, maybe you can say how long you do, but I'll tell you sort of how we deal with dry stored peonies. Uh, yeah, we uh, we sell pretty quickly. Um, you know, everybody's excited for peony when they first come, um, they first start blooming. Everybody's really excited. So they just start selling and we have such a quick season that it's not generally a problem. So um, we try and keep it to like a week. Sometimes we go to like maybe two weeks, but I've, I've actually heard that they can uh, store for like six or seven or eight, you know, but I, I haven't tried that and I would be a little uncomfortable with that. I don't, I don't know how it would affect the yeah. baseline. So we do buy dry stored peonies for events for sure. Um, they can be, we've had farmers that have um, stored them for weeks and sometimes even months. We have a vegetable farmer here in Baltimore who has some sort of magic box. That's what we call it, the magic box. It's some kind of apple storage box where she stores peonies from May and she opens them up in the fall and there they are. They're all ready to go. Um, but the vase life, I think I'm always worried about vase life. So I would only be using dry stored peonies for events. And when I say dry stored, I mean like when you're in the past three or four weeks. Um, I think if you're storing for more than four weeks, it's good etiquette to tell a florist that they've been stored just so that the florist can decide um, what to use them for. So if I don't know and I use them for a single order and then they die after a day and then the customer gets mad at me, um, you know, it's sort of a lose-lose for everybody. So I think it's just good etiquette to let a florist know when you're selling them dried stored peonies, how long they've been, they've been stored. And if you want to use them for single orders, I would say test them out. Uh, we do that a lot. You know, we get them in, we test them out. They open pretty quickly once they, you know, have been hydrated um, for events. They're great. We just don't use them a ton for single orders. And then if you find yourself at the end of the season with a bunch of peonies left over, sometimes we do because my, you know, eyes are bigger than my stomach in that way. I often order more peonies than um, we can move as quickly. Um, we're careful to not sell, you know, peonies that have been in the cooler for a little while. We really try to move them fresh as quickly as we can. Um, but air drying is a great option if you're left with peonies at the end of the season. And there's lots of other ways to dry, you know, with silica and all kinds of other ways, but we really do just air dry. It is the simplest, uh, low cost, uh, low tech way to do it. Uh, we just hang them upside down in a cool, dark, dry place. You really don't want any moisture in there. We take off all the leaves and then that's it. We just let them sit until they're really crunchy. Um, and that could be two weeks, three weeks, depending on the moisture in the shop. 
Um, we do try to keep the stems as long as possible. That just gives us more flexibility. Sometimes we'll have people that want dried arrangements that are very tall. Um, and we always usually have very short stems of stuff. So if you can leave the stems long, I think that does give you a little bit more um, flexibility in doing that. And um, singles and semi-doubles don't work as well as the doubles or the bombs work for dried. Um, we do dry them all, but those two definitely doubles and bombs work the best. And these are just a couple ways that we use our dried peonies um, starting really at the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall. We make dried bouquets. Uh, we make uh, dried wreaths on metal hoops, just like the one you see there in the middle. And then we do full covered dried wreaths. And they're really, um, really a lot of fun. People love them. They're highly sought after. We can charge a lot for them. People really will pay for, for these pieces. And the peony colors, I think, add really a great, interesting, unique color, especially in the fall. It's not, you know, your standard sort of orange, yellow, burgundy. You're really getting some nice pinks in there um, in the fall. So if you can save some for dried stuff in the fall, I think, you know, your customers will definitely love them. All right, everyone. Um, if you have any more questions that you want to type into the chat, please do that now. Um, Karen and I also have our websites up here, so you're always um, welcome to reach out to us with questions. Um, Karen, I do see somebody asked about a foliar spray, something called Neptune foliar spray. Want to know if you use it? Um, and oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, they've got like seaweed and fish and all that kind of stuff. I, I bought it, but I never used, <laughs> used it. Um, I've, I've heard good things about it. I think it's probably uh, good to use um, to, to be candid. My, my spraying is, you know, we've got such a quick uh, season that we're so busy harvesting. And then I usually do any spraying, which is very little because we're certified naturally grown um, afterwards. And I usually just keep it to like fungicide. Um, the, the Neptune stuff is more of a fertilizer that um, is taken in through the foliage. And, you know, we just do the, I find it easier to um, do kind of the pelletized fer fertilizer, you know, in the early spring when we're getting, when we're doing the weeding. So I think it's great, but I haven't really used it. And then this same person asks if it's crazy to be growing naturally without landscape fabric. Ooh, I don't know, because I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we had so much weed pressure when we were doing the mixed bouquet thing. Um, I can't imagine um, farming without it, but because the peony, you know, it's just, it's one plant every three feet that if you, if you got a way to, you know, either mow or whatever it is you're doing to, um, you know, maybe you've got a hoe that you just go through, you know, daily or weekly or something like that. If you've got something that keeps those weeds at bay, then go for it. I think it's better. I would rather not use the weed fabric, but yeah. I just, um, I haven't experimented enough to find a good alternative. Right. Okay. All right. Any last questions tonight before we sign off? It was really a pleasure uh, talking to everybody tonight. As you can tell, Karen and I both very enthusiastic about peonies. Um, this is a topic we both love to talk so much about. So if you, you know, end up having more questions after you rewatch or later tonight, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to uh, take your questions. Oh, somebody That's says cool. I franchise my store to Roanoke. Um, yeah, great. Um, at 50, almost one years old, uh, the only thing I'm doing is like downsizing. <laughs> um, but thank you for the thank you for the the comment. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Um, I hope you'll come back. Karen and I um, appreciated you. We Locoflow is going to do another one of these webinars in two weeks with my friend Lauren Ulig of Floor by Eight. She is a rose grower here in Baltimore City. She is amazing. And if you are even mildly considering roses, or if you have written roses off, um, this I think will be a great presentation. Lauren grows in her backyard in Baltimore City, and she is now serving florists across the state of Maryland and into DC. Um, 
So yeah, please, please check that out. There'll be more information out about that. And Karen, um, one more question somebody had. Any favorite very late varieties for peonies? Uh, yeah, our very late ones. I mean, Sarah Bernhardt is a late. Uh, I think it's even, it might be a very late. I can't remember. Um, and then we have, uh, I think Elsa Sass is the white one um, that grows very late for us. So that's another one that we have. I mean, honestly, you can look at our website and it shows everything that we grow at midsummerfarm.com. We've got, you know, you just go to the pet flower section and it shows shows you everything. So I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but those are two of them that we definitely use that are late. Definitely check out Karen's website. It is a it is a beautiful, it is beautiful display of peonies. It's really uh it's it, it's what caught my eye when I first uh started working with her, just like the amazing photos of varieties that they have. It's really, really quite oh, great. It's, it's so much fun to to like grow these unique ones too. You know, it's oh yeah. I have to just as a last kind of parting comment, you know, when you when you're shopping for roots, you know, you're Sarah Bernhardt, what's great about that is that they're relatively inexpensive, right? Because they're so common that the roots are pretty cheap. Um, but really for 10 or $20 extra per root, you can get these really unique varieties that most florists haven't seen or don't, aren't aware of. And they live for 50 years, right? So, so to me, it's just totally worth that, that extra expenditure um, to get the more unique stuff. You know, you can also get some of the common stuff to mix it in. But, um, you know, the stuff like Etch Salmon and Lorelei and all of these um, really phenomenal colors and forms and the more modern varieties, they're just beautiful. Yeah. Somebody asked if you buy roots in the spring or in the fall. Uh, normally for wholesale, the wholesale um, websites, including Peony Shop, open usually around January. Um, and you want to order as soon as possible because they do sell out. So they usually get ordered, you know, over the winter, but then they get delivered in October because that's when you want to plant is in the fall. Yeah. So. All right. So everybody better get, get ready to go in the fall with your, with your peony orders. Yeah. I mean, you can still order them now, but there's just not, not nearly as much choice right now for the, for like this October, for example. Cool. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Come see us yeah. again uh, for roses and more flower talk in the future. Thanks, Karen, so much. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Have a good night.